And Aaron Miesen is the Vice President of Interface. Nice to see you, Aaron. First time to meet. <laughs> so thank you very much, and it's, let's talk about scale right now. Right, thanks. Um, and, and Mike, thanks for offering to, to fill in, but uh, given our time constraints, um, you're off the hook. So, uh, you know, as we, as we look at, at, at what we've been listening to today, uh, you know, it strikes me that, you know, so much of the conversation around us, there's, there's such value in these plastics that, that we talk about, but yet we're not capturing that value. And we see the challenges of, of what's next for plastics. Uh, that was great that, that Bill, uh, you know, instead of talking about end of life, it's, it's what's next. And we, and we see that there's challenges for that. And we, and we also have seen a lot of very creative and innovative solutions, but oftentimes these solutions are are small, are, are just getting going. And so th as we think about that and we think about you know, the opportunity to, to find that value, to create that value, it really becomes a, a challenge of scale. Uh, you know, how do we take the solutions that we have to scale and quickly, because the problems are growing quickly, we have to scale the solutions even quicker to get in front of this. And so with that, I, I wanted to, uh, to introduce uh, First, I'm going to introduce Steve and let uh, let Steve, you know, kind of give uh, a little spiel and, and teach you a little bit about NatureWorks, and then we'll move to Aaron. Um, and you know, just so you understand, my background: uh, I spent much of my career at the Dow Chemical Company, most of it in the plastics industry. My last role at Dow was Global Plastics Sustainability Leader. Dow made the mistake of of loaning me to UC Berkeley to uh, to run a sustainability center and teach there. And at the end of it, they said, come back to Midland, Michigan. And I said, no thanks. And so I, I've joined the, the ranks of, of consultants and, and live out of the Bay Area now. But uh, uh, it, if you're wondering why I'm up here, it's, it's because of, of the knowledge that I have and, and the background. I've known Mike uh, too long, right? We've known each other, uh, yeah, yeah, at least 20-some uh, years, yeah. So anyway with that steve uh, please uh, tell us a little bit about what you do and, and nature works yeah and i'm going to stand good um i think this mic is working somebody wave at me if it's not yeah oh if it, if it changes tell me so what i want to do in a couple of quick minutes is level set on who nature works is what we do um michael in the back if you could throw up some slides this would help i got a couple of simple visuals if they don't show i can live without it um michael anytime so some of you know us, some of you don't. What NatureWorks is, very simply, is a for-profit company that is formed very simply around the business of turning greenhouse gases into performance products. We take the carbon that's in the atmosphere, causing global warming. Thank you. And we turn it into a family of NGO grades, NGO resin grades. Most of those today are, no, are polylactide, PLA grades. We also sell a variety of chemical intermediates that go into things like surfactants, toners, and adhesives. I make this point very simply what the real feedstock is for us, and I think this has been well framed up by what Bill McDonough did earlier, greenhouse gas, that carbon is 100% of the carbon in the products we sell, because when you frame things up in this way, it makes you ask what we think are the right questions. What we're doing today, of course, to transform greenhouse gas into performance products is we capture the carbon, and you've, again, Bill framed this up nicely with the analogy of the tree and how it literally sequesters carbon. We harvest plants that sequester carbon, we take the plant sugars, we ferment those, a lot like making beer or wine, but we don't make alcohol, we make something called lactic acid. It's a naturally occurring material in the body, very safe, you find it in yogurt. We've industrialized it in some of the world's biggest fermenters. And we turn that lactic acid, that green building block, into a variety of plastics. Now, the reason I make this point about, the, in my cartoon chart here, this is sort of a circuitous route to get from point A, greenhouse gas, to point B, products, is because it is just that. It's a really, in retrospect, a long-winded way of doing it. We often get the question, because we sell around the globe to many global brands and some of the world's largest retailers, is what is the right feedstock? And I think the, the question concerns us because it's sort of the silver bullet mentality yeah, yeah. that there is one right feedstock or there is one right end of life or reuse mechanism. We are firmly of the belief that, that we, what is needed is a diversified portfolio of, of means to transform greenhouse gas into products. What we're doing today, of course, is our plant is in the Midwest. We're doing it with cornstarch, purpose-grown cornstarch that we ferment. We're engineering now a second facility that will probably go into Thailand, which is one of our corporate parents based there, that will take sugarcane. We remain very interested, and this comes to the question of scale, in cellulosics, so-called second-generation feedstocks. 
but we've invested the last two years in an intensive due diligence around all the, the companies out there with cellulosic technologies to really understand their economics and how they scale. Back to the topic here. What we're actually further along with in our thinking is what we simply have called next generation feedstocks. We're going back to my cartoon. We look, if, if your true feedstock is greenhouse gas, how do you go in one step to the products you want? Why go an agricultural route at all? So we've talked to a couple of companies that literally design microbes that digest CO2, and to put it nicely, excrete lactic acid. We've talked to one in particular that does the same thing with methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas, more than 20 times worse in global warming than CO2. And what we've just done a year ago is formed a partnership with a company in Menlo Park, California, to ferment methane from any source, AD, landfill, wastewater treatment, to ferment methane into lactic acid. What's novel to us about this is, one, it radically changes the supply chain. We've skipped all those agricultural steps. Radical cost takeout is what we're thinking. That's the, whole, that's the name of the game here. It also, for some, sidesteps uh, an agricultural concern of what is the impact on land. So our partner, just a year on now, just this week, announced they've made lab-scale progress, now fermenting and making methane into lactic acid, the green building block for our plastics. Step one of a five-year journey, many points at which this could fail. But the point for us, again, simply put, is that there isn't one right answer. There's going to be a portfolio. And it's all about whatever is locally abundant. And I love the way Bill framed up with not a scarcity mentality, but an abundant mentality. Nature doesn't look at carbon in the atmosphere as a problem. It's what trees are made from, coral reefs, and so on. It's a feedstock. That is our mentality. So very quickly, two more, two more visuals for you, and then I'll hand it back. With, with that pedigree of low carbon footprint products, we've got great interest in broad markets. This is the arenas we're in. Many people have think of us as a packaging play. Those are healthy markets for us. Our biggest single market actually now is fibers. Angio fibers going into baby diapers, baby diapers, baby wipes. Injection molded durable products are, is, a, is a big growing market for us. Things like this iPhone case, again, atmospheric carbon turned into an injection molded product. There's so much happening as well downstream that we've actually formed what we call a business incubator to capture it and nurture it and make sure that we're producing the right grades for nascent new markets. At the far right, we already heard about 3D printing today. The polymer of choice for 3D printing, something that folks drive right down the road in Brooklyn, MakerBot, are using is none other than Ingeo. Folks don't like the smell of styrene and they love the dimensional stability they get, the, the accuracy of the part they can print with Ingeo. So things like that are growing fast. Who knew three years ago? So that's the markets we're in. Very quickly, we've talked about what we make things from, where it's going, and then where they go. In a cradle-to-cradle -cradle mentality, all our grades are in, our uh, NGO grades are cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified. We've sort of racked up the plastics we often are seen as competing with. Typically can be recycled, can go through some sort of energy recovery step. And you heard from Agilix, a nice frame out of the options there. We could check more boxes, and what we are talking about now, and what I hope we have time to get into, is how we achieve scale and move composting and recycle from nice theoretical construct to reality with new to the world materials. So, back to you. Great, thanks. Thanks, yeah, and we, we will get into some of those questions, but before that, Aaron, why don't you uh, tell us a little about you and interface and... and sure. I'm gonna take my time actually to show you a video. Sorry, I've gotta get out of the sun. I can barely see <laughs> half of you. And so my cheap Irish skin, I'm probably already getting a sunburn. Um, so my name's Erin Mizan. I work for a company called Interface. The two second is we are a company that makes carpet tile, but we are very focused on becoming a sustainable enterprise. So I don't you know, wanna talk much beyond that, and I wanna sort of talk about what we think is possible. And I want to do that by showing a video. And the reason I want to do that is because we found that in the 20 plus years that we've been focused on this as a company, people don't respond to graphs and charts. They don't respond to eco labels. They don't respond to you ought to. And I'm sorry to tell you guys, there's been a lot of that here today. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of that in the market for the last 20 years. As a consumer, I've gotten a lot of those messages. And I think it really is about telling people what's possible, exciting people, really mobilizing people to sort of actively opt in to a better kind of vision of where we're going. So I was interested to see, I think it was Mike who showed Chris Jordan's photography, um, the albatross chicks on Midway Island. There have been so many great examples of using imagery to talk about the challenges 
but I've rarely seen anybody provide something really compelling in terms of a vision about where we should be going. So I want to share this video, and I hope it tees up some of the issues and some of the lessons we've learned about failing fast, about finding innovative and different partners, um, about looking for innovative sources of funding and how we did that, and really allow us to all sort of talk about scale. So with that, video. hopefully, video. part of the Philippines is completely dependent upon the sea, one way or another. Denahan Bank is now one of the most degraded coral reefs in the world, with some of the highest fishing pressure. Fishers use, especially in the Philippines, use a lot of monofilament and nylon nets. When discarded nets get into the marine environment and they just hang around, they can last for 600 plus years. This is a really high performance engineering plastic. You know, nylon 6 is in our carpet. It's also in lots of other products that people will use every day. So. We want to make sure that material can be used again. Networks is a program that takes discarded fishing nets from impoverished communities and recycles them into carpet tile. The idea is to collect discarded fishing nets off the beaches or get them from um, fishers as soon as they have finished using them. What's really important about this program is that it's not a one-shot beach cleanup for some nice pictures. It's actually about how do you institutionalize nets and ultimately other material recycling in communities in a way that benefits them in the long term. The product is still our product, beautiful carpet tile. It will look the same, but there'll be this story behind the material. This to me is the start of this being a restorative enterprise. And we're giving back and giving opportunities that are way beyond what maybe people would think a carpet tile company could do. Uh, and this is only the beginning. Excellent, thank you. So I think that does a really great way of doing a couple things, of showing you how to create a vision, of showing you kind of the power of telling a story and seeing the people that it impacts, but also on the real programmatic side, we've dealt with a lot of the issues and will continue to deal with a lot of the issues around how do you find funding? How do you find partners? How do you scale when there's no legislative imperative, when your customers aren't absolutely demanding this? So a lot of interesting things we could talk about that I think that tees up. So with that, I sort of hand it back to you, Tony. Yeah, well, I think, I think that, that brings up the question of, of how do you begin scaling this and how do you find other partners in, in, a, in a program like that, which is terribly creative, but okay, you know, how many carpet titles are we generating here and, and how do we get other partners engaged and, and bring in other sectors? Yeah. Well, so I think one of the lessons learned for us there was to start with the material. Um, I think there are a lot of companies who are doing great philanthropic things with beach cleanups and local communities, but nylon is our biggest raw material. It accounts for 85 to 90% of the footprint of our product. So we started by saying, first of all, how do we learn how to take this back as a company? And then secondly, how do we look in the environment for where this material is and build a partnership around that? And then sort of what we did was once we identified we've really got to build this coalition around nylon, we started asking people, where does this exist in the environment aside from in our products and how do we harvest it? And it led us to a really interesting conversation with the Zoological Society of London. And what's been really fantastic about that is it's a bunch of people who think very differently, um, who have a lot of programmatic knowledge, but who also have access to a very different level of funding that we do. Typically a foundation, a private foundation, would not give a for-profit business like Interface a grant to experiment. So this partnership sort of had really interesting implications around funding and programmatic structure. How did you find the Zoological Society of London? 
We, um, we had a workshop in London and literally started calling a lot of our partners who work in the marine environment after having done a materials analysis and saying, where do we find nylon in the waste stream? One of the biggest places you find it is in the oceans, is in commercial fishing nets and small community fishing nets. So once we did that material analysis, then we started saying, who in the world is working on this besides us? Who is an aligned interest with Interface in getting nylon back? And it led us to a bunch of NGOs. And we brought them all together and said, who would be interested in creating a partnership with us? Yeah. Steve, I, turning to you, you, you kind of broached the subject of, of the next life for, uh, for NGO PLA. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a relatively new polymer as, as polymers go, you know, kind of in the, in the 10 to 20 year range versus something like polyethylene or polystyrene or polypropylene. How, how do you get to scale? Now that you've got scale from a manufacturing standpoint, how do you get scale from a composting or a, a recycling standpoint? It's key. And I'm assuming this mic still works and somebody will wave if it doesn't. Um, I, won't, I better not okay. use both. This will get confusing. Um, how we get to scale, it, a couple of ways. One, I think, is challenging the scale that's been predefined by the existing infrastructure. You, you may have heard this earlier today. If not, it's a number that current, current, many times gets bandied about. When talking about recycling polymers, the conventional industry uh, wisdom is that a, a polymer needs to be out there at three to 400 million pounds scale in a given market to be recycled economically. That's true with the current infrastructure and the way it's being used, and therein lies the problem, and therein lies why for EPA there's less than 10% of all plastics being recycled. So partly I think it's about redefining the scale that makes sense for you and not getting stuck with the existing models. Our strategy is very simple. We're growing scale by selling our resin in packaging specifically, for example, into markets where unfortunately there is very little recycling occurring. So after some stops and starts, we've not sold into bottles for the last year. We've exited that market frustrated some customers, but very sympathetic to the fact that bottles, the one thing that has been sort of harmonized on one material, don't want to screw that up. So staying out of things that are being successfully recycled, building volume in applications that really are not, and, and mixed rigids is, is that where you can have a clear container that is polystyrene, is polypropylene, still some PVC, some PET, and now some India. Those are all created equal. None of them play well together. All of them can be easily identified by near infrared, but many, you know, most facilities don't have that. And so we want to be the first clear rigid to be plucked out. We're starting uh, to, to, and, and the long-winded answer, but the, the challenge we often get thrown at us is you need to do three things to recycle. You need to be able to collect it and then collect or sort it. Then you need to be able to convert it. And then you need an end market. And what the incumbent industry often throws at us is, well, look, nobody will collect it unless there's an end market. And an end market will never come unless you're collecting it. So new plastic, you're stuck. And it's a clever argument, but it's a bit self-serving, really, for the incumbent <laughs> plastics. The incumbent plastics work through this. What we're doing, again, growing volume where it's not really interfering with anything, um, working on some new models for recycle, and we heard about this yeah. in the conference who were on the, on the platform uh, together in California last week, and, and heard about a secondary MERV scheme where uh, a business... Are you, are you familiar with secondary MERVs? Essentially, they, they take the stuff that comes off the back of the... The, the existing MRFs, the, the traditional MRFs that are out there, many of which were built uh, 5, 10, 15 years ago with, with what they expected the waste stream to be then, and then they can't handle the, the waste that's the, the recyclables that are coming at them today. So they take the stuff that kind of comes off the back end and using newer technology, uh, resort it essentially and create more value from it. Very interesting concept. And there's a, there's a plant uh, in Los Angeles that's come online that really interested to see uh, how successful it can be. And so the, the concept simply is rather than going to every MRF and having to put in technology that doesn't exist, you go to a, a, a customer that can perhaps take residual streams, which they may even have to pay to dispose of, from say five to 10 LA MRFs, and mine those. Mine those for materials like PET, like HDPE, but also for our own. We meet yeah. our bail spec and we're buying it back because it's clear to us, we have a unique position. We know better than anybody how to sell PLA and doing it to the tune of over 100,000 tons a year, why not have an RPL in grade? So we have a unique position to be market maker that I don't see, uh, this is really not in the interest of any incumbent plastic out there to do that. Yeah. We are running, you know, we have a three year timeline, we see we'll be needing a second facility, which we're engineering now, so why not resell our own material? Or resell our competitors' material, I, I like that model. Yeah, 
Well, and, and, and you're in a situation where you kind of play in this in this resin alone mm. at, at scale. At scale. Yeah. At scale. And, and in the carpet industry, you're not alone, right? I mean, you're the you're the main carpet tile manufacturer, but this is a different business than than the carpet that we have in our homes. You want to talk a little bit about you know the challenges of kind of bringing an industry forward? Sure. So uh, you know, I mean, we're, we we operate in an industry making a product of carpet tile, and we compete against other companies who make conventional broadloom carpeting, which is a different material. So you have this really sort of interesting dynamic in the industry where the vast majority of it is actually, or you know, half is non-nylon, but a different material. So we've got sort of that dynamic. Then we have the competitive dynamic. So then we have sort of an experiment that the carpet industry has tried over the last five years, Ten, 10 years, but maybe five years in earnest to do it voluntarily. And anyone who's part of a trade association is completely aware of the dynamics that happen there. Um, you end up with the lowest common denominator. Um, there isn't sort of really a vast strategic effort, and it ends up being always a bit of a pilot, underfunded, never integrated into the core business. So, you know, we've had this experiment happening in the carpet industry. The vast majority of our competitors do not support extended producer responsibility. As far as I'm aware of, we're the only carpet tile manufacturer, the only carpet manufacturer um, who's gone on record saying we actually want this. We actually want to sort of be required for there to be an approach for us to take these products back. Why? Because we already want it back. We view it as a really valuable raw material to bring those carpet tiles back, separate them, recycle them, and we'd like a value on that. We'd like a structure and a, and a system to be able to do that. So being that one voice in the entire whole who doesn't want it has been a really interesting and awkward position for us. And every year we have this sort of anxiety-ridden debate about do we continue to be a part of this trade association? Do we pull out? And the, the idea is always we continue to hope to influence them by continuing to be at the table. But it's become increasingly difficult with a couple of years ago, California passing a producer responsibility uh, law for carpet, and there's at least a dozen states that I'm aware of that are looking at it right now as well. Yeah. So I, I've got lots more questions, but it, you know, I want to I want to open this up to to the audience uh, if you have some some questions, and, and feel feel free I think to to ask a question about scale of any of the kind of previous speakers. I mean. You know, it doesn't have to be just for, yeah. for Aaron and, and Steve. Um, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're, this, is, this is the challenge, right? You know, we've got to come up with solutions faster than the problems are building. And the problems are building rapidly. And we need to get on top of this. And so, uh, lots of creativity out there, lots of great visions, but we've got a, we've got a big challenge in front of us. So. Over here. Hi, <coughs> sorry, my name's Lee Clayton from the UK. Um, firstly, Doug, what a great event. It's the first one I've been to in the US. Uh, I go to many, many trade associations and talks like these in Europe and the UK. I'm a member of many of them, but I think this is the first time I've seen such a, a broad spectrum of speakers. We generally get the same guy saying the same thing, <laughs> whinging about the same problems. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a breath of fresh air for me, so well done to you and your team. Um, I think. First, I've sat through this whole day, and, and it's really been interesting to see the problems you guys are having. And you know, you mentioned that Europe's doing really well in terms of what it's collecting versus what it's recycling. It's not as great as it may appear if you scratch the surface. So, if you look at Switzerland, we had that may mentioned earlier. They they recover 90%. They actually re only recycle single figures. The rest of it they stick up a chimney because they see that as the way forward. In the UK, um, we don't. So we have quite a low recovery. But we have high recycling um, because there's a huge public backlash against incineration. In fact, we don't even call it incineration. It's called energy from waste because we don't want to hear that word. Um, it's interesting to hear about scale and bridging the gap and how you're going to move. It took many, many years in the UK. I've been fortunate enough to be in it for 25 years. And we had a plateau for many years. Nothing changed. It just sat like this. And everybody was waiting for something to happen. And it only really happened when there was a buy-in from the producers. So. Coca-Cola committed in the UK, and they made, a, I think, an eight million investment just recently on a bottle-to-bottle a a -bottle plant. Um, and then the dairy industry has also now bought into something, we call it the Courtauld, 
um, agreement where the major producers have agreed that they'll put a certain amount of recycler into, back into the packaging industry. And so that gives the, the closed loop circular economy, um, which gives the innovators such as Mike and myself the confidence to invest. Because yeah. we wouldn't invest because we couldn't get any commitment from the waste management companies to sell and we couldn't get any commitment from the users to buy. So we end up you know, in, the back, in your back street garage, churning low grade, low quality. We were the dirty man of the industry and you know, there was no real specification and we'll give you a credit note, we'll take it back. That's changed now. So the specification that's produced is the same as Virgin. Um, they're willing to pay more than Virgin material, wow. seriously. Um, and also the waste management companies are buying into that as well. So we can invest, we can scale up, um, and so there's now a commitment. So this plateau, if you look at the figures in the UK, it's gone like this. Um, the problem that we have now is the quality. So your twos, to, or we call them pots, tubs, and trays. It's a lot easier than referring to numbers because we're not very good at numbers. Um, so pots, tubs, and trays, everything that's PT and not um, PT on HDPE. Um, we have a real problem now because China's closed, everything was exported. And so what you referred to earlier, uh, we call them PERFs in the UK. You may have heard the term, which is a plastics recovery facility. So the MERFs in the UK are obsolete and it would cost too much money to reverse engineer to recover those secondary raw materials. And so what they're looking at doing is putting PERFs in. The waste management companies now buy into it because where they could rely on export, it's no longer there. So it's now a liability to their their P&L account. So okay, that, those secondary materials... You've got, a, you've got a, a pile. You've got a big enough pile. Oh, man. Pile is not the word. Fields of this stuff. And we don't have many fields and, in the UK. And when you've got a big enough pile of anything or a field of anything, then the entrepreneurs step in because they know that they've got an opportunity there. Yeah. So uh, the entrepreneur's window is now open. It is now our time. So whereas before, we've, we've been ignored and we've just been... In fact, we've almost been a, a hindrance to the re producers. They, didn't really want, they don't really want recycling in there. They wouldn't let us sit on the uh, working groups and the steering groups because they don't want to promote recycler. They want to carry on doing what they're doing. But now, now is our time. And so Mike has partnered up with a major producer. I, you know, the company that I have has partnered up with the third largest waste management company in the UK, and it's growing. They've now realized that there has to be a synergy. So in terms of scale and moving forward, the, the, all the solutions have been here today. You know, we're not trying to crack the atom here. Yeah. The solutions are here, whether it's Growing fungi, um, no, 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 fuel derived, it's there. MC squared. I think he did talk about cracking the atom. Yeah, yeah, but they did that years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what I'm saying is, that I think the solutions are here. We had 300 local authorities, and I'm going on, and it was like trying to deal with 300 different governments. Yeah. Nobody would talk to anybody else. So, whoever was, was operating on world class manufacturing or recycling never spoke to the guy down the road who was struggling. And that lack of communication was what. No, and I think, I think a takeaway from this is that we do need to communicate and we need to learn from, from what others are doing and what leads to those successes at scale and then figure out how to duplicate that. So, uh, question, yes, here. All right, um, this is going to go to the scale question that everyone okay. is asking about. Um, okay, I don't need to yell, I guess. Um, we're running into just uh, problems with getting somebody to commit to buy our product to get the volume that would allow somebody to invest because they need the commitment from someone to buy and people right. aren't gonna buy until someone commits to making the investment. It's this big circular, yeah, circular issue. Argument. So my question is actually to anybody here, has anybody successfully bridged that gap or figured out a way to get whatever commitments are necessary to create almost a consortium of people to help move something new through the system. Yeah, so that I, I've heard that same argument comes up that, that folks, you know, in order to get that investment, they need to they need to have something beyond themselves of, you know, creating the, the pellets or creating the product that they need somebody that's gonna buy those, that commitment before they're willing to invest. I, and, and I've heard of letters of commitments from folks. I don't know, Mike, have you uh, run into that where issue. Uh, I mean, what you ideally want when you're building a big plant a capital project is what's called project financing. And project financing, classical project financing, means you've got offtake and intake agreements. So you've got, you've secured your supply of raw material, 
and you've secured your customer for the offtake. And the classic would be a, a biorefinery that has a customer that, that signed a, let's say, 10 year agreement at a certain price range for their product, and they've got a, if it's an ag source uh, of material, they've got a, a five to 10 year agreement there. <clears throat> In the waste industry, it's harder, and we, we heard <laughs> some of the, the discussions about that. In plastics recycling, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to make it sound easier than it is, but frankly, selling the product is not easy, but it's not the hard bit. <laughs> you know, it's the easiest. If you look at the three things, the, the nuts I had to crack. Big pile. It's the big pile. And the trouble is, and I, I didn't really explain it very well, and I had the perfect question, but I didn't answer it very well. So let me answer it now. It's so important. And we've heard a little bit people touch on it. The reason you don't see that many plastics recycling plants in the U.S. is not availability of supply. And Steve Russell talked about how much more plastic is now available for commercial. You're going to see a huge amount of it tomorrow. A lot of it gets shipped offshore. And it gets shipped offshore for lower cost recycling. supply agreement, but not a single one of them will give us a, even a five-year supply agreement on the off-table. So that's the fundamental problem and why we don't see it scaling here. And I don't know how to solve that, frankly, because it, you know, I'm not going to make the investment. My investor's not going to make the investment. A bank's not going to loan against it unless I can securitize that supply, supply chain. I don't have any trouble convincing anyone that we can sell the material. Yeah. That's so it, it may be, yeah. So if you, if you go back to the to Walmart Sustainability Expo a few months ago and the big announcement around the, the closed loop fund, $100 million. Maybe we need to, to get signatures from those folks. On, on, I just, uh, let me be a little bit more clear. Because I love Ron's talk. Ron, go yeah. ahead. Everybody, Ron's talk was great. And I, I think Ron's great. Uh, and what he's doing is great. And I, the fund is fantastic. And hopefully it's going to go to $500 million. I think that's their dream at least. But what I hear, what I heard him say, and what I think they're going to be targeting is just trying to increase the collection rate. That's great. Collection's great. The gap, however, is where it goes. We have no chain of custody, no, no responsibility for how that material is treated. And let me give you just one analogy that'll help drive that home better. Uh, how many remember all the heat that Nike took on how its products were being made uh, 20 years ago in the sweatshops? Yeah. How fast did they change behavior because there was so much uproar? Pretty quickly. And the whole industry, they happened to pick on Nike because they were the big name, but you know everybody was doing the same thing. What about Apple more recently, a year ago, or so ago, all the heat they took? Well, they changed very quickly. And it woke everybody up. So we care about how our stuff's made. We really do, thankfully. We care about how it's made. You see how it's unmade or how it can be unmade. Let me tell you, that's 10 to 100 times more damaging to humans and the environment unmaking stuff than making it if it's done improperly. It can be unmade and, and kept in the technical cycle, as Bill likes to talk about, very well and very safely to the human ecosystem, but it can also be done very unsafely. Unmaking stuff is much more dangerous than making it. So if we care about how our stuff's made, we really ought to care how it's unmade. And as soon as we do, like Europe does, Canada, even our neighbors to the north care about it. To, for me to get material at my plant in China from Canada, I have to, we have to fill out forms this thick. 
pain in the butt, but I, I, thank, I thank them for doing it because it levels the playing field. It, it says, look, if you want me to ship this out of my country, you're going to have to show me you, you have the same standards as the plant you, I would force you to build in my country. We have to prove that to them. Europe, most European countries, same, same way. So that would change the game for recycling in the United States if we just said we care about where our stuff goes. Well, I, and we're, we're, I think, going to be here for, uh, for drinks. And I think it's, uh, we're between you and, uh, and drinks. So let me turn this back over to Doug and uh, thank we Tony. continue the conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I just um, appreciate all of you uh, on the panel. I'm going to have Scott here do a quick closing, and then I'm going to say the last few words. Why don't you just stay on the panel? OK. Hi, I'll be brief. Um, I'm Scott Ballantyne, and uh, I was a 15-year veteran with Microsoft. And Microsoft's mission, you know, is all about uh, connecting people and helping them realize their potential and stuff. And I've been on the sustainability journey a long time. Uh, a lot of you have worked with, a lot of you have tried to connect and make things happen. And it's just, it's really impressive to see everybody here. Take a minute and look around and thank yourselves for being here. And thank Doug for putting this together. Um, I think it's, it's really great. Um, you know, I, I, used to, I used to have a slide that I talked a lot on, and on the right-hand side it had um, all my, my yard waste, my recycle, and my trash bin, and it said me. And on the left-hand side it had a little shadow image of a bunch of people. And it used to say, I'm one guy, I'm a packaging guy. What can I do? I can recycle, I can do this, I can do that. Then the other side is, plus, what can we do? And that we goes far beyond everyone that's in here. And so I think it's important when you leave here, to continue to keep on the sustainability journey and bring others along, because it is important. Um, you know, some of you heard me talk about, or someone mentioned the globe that I carry in my pocket. This is actually a stone that I picked up in the jade market in Hong Kong on one of my trips over there for product launches. It looked like the earth and it reminded me that there's just one planet. And like Bill said, you know, all the stuff is here, except for the few that are up there in the space that we launched up there. Um, every resource is right here. We've got to work together around the world and not point fingers and not say it's difficult and all that. Just keep on the journey. It's important. Okay? Thank you. So, as Scott said, um, I'd like to give you, know, have you all give yourselves a hand for sitting through this hot sunny day in New York. Um, it's been great. We have drinks uh, sponsored by SABIC, and we're very, uh, thank you very much to all the sponsors, SPI, ACC, um, EcoCycle, Plastic Bank, Waste to Wear, uh, Nature Works, and please enjoy yourself. It's an unbelievable rooftop. There's sunglasses sponsored by MiniWiz, which are made from DVDs and rice husk. And we have a lot of, you know, we didn't have a lot of chance to network because we were sitting here hearing all the experts. So please take.